to introduce very briefly the panel and then indeed we're going to throw the first question at them but we'll start at the, uh, the far left end where we have uh, Mr. Manfred uh, Engelhardt who is the technology manager for energy at M&W Central Europe GmbH. Uh, he holds the function as the manager there and indeed focuses on the wide coordination and development of renewable energy systems including CSP, photovoltaic and biomass applications. So I believe you have a very good broad view of how renewables are developing in, in Europe today. And next day we have Stuart Brannigan, the Chief Sales Officer of Solo, Solar Solutions, and indeed an official supplier of AEG solar modules. He's got over 25 years of experience in the PV industry and has held leading positions in global companies such as BP Solar, good old days, and Yingli, as well as in major industry associations such as my own, used to be called EPIA and PV Cycle. And indeed, next to Stuart, we have Sven Kunsel, the Managing Director of Renusol. He started his career as a project manager for large-scale PV installations at UV. Um, and he spent almost four years as Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Schletter. So indeed, we'll be bringing a great deal of insights to this debate today. And then finally, next to him, we have Golo Val, the Senior Director for Business Development in the energy segment of Flex. And indeed, he's responsible for identifying partnerships with companies in the EMEA region, uh, indeed to support and leverage global assets and services for Flex. So indeed, you will have to say we have a very good panel here today, and we have a very simple opening question. And I would like you to give two, three, maybe five minutes of your opinions on how you see the European solar market's future and is there a role for storage and what difference will it make to how solar will come along? I think we will start at the far end with Manfred and I'll come and sit and join you. Hello everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me on this um, panel. I'm glad to be here and uh, uh, contribute. Um, as the uh, role of the technology manager in energy in MW, um, I experienced quite a lot in energy systems. Um, so. Uh, not only PV, but uh, uh, storage and uh, biomass and uh, actually uh, nuclear um, <coughs> and thermal uh, energy systems. So um, I'd like, uh, uh, and I look for PV uh, since, it, uh, since the beginning at uh, 2002. Yeah. <coughs> we uh, looked in the company for, uh, for first installations um, and then uh, we really took off in 2005, six uh, uh, something as an um, EPC contractor. And... Um, um, <coughs> my, uh, my answer to the question, uh, will Europe uh, have a bright future, a future to the, to the um, uh, photovoltaic side? I think uh, yes indeed, there is a good future for PV there and I have my reasons. Yeah. Oh, that's a good answer already, so already happy. <laughs> Very pleased to elaborate. <laughs> yeah, um, what's, what's my answer? Um, my answer is uh, we will uh, benefit from uh, fall, further falling prices in, um, in the system level, not only in modules, uh, what we hope to uh, see from Asian vendors, even in the balance of system, uh, we see uh, um, we see good prices and the lower levelized cost of energy in, uh, uh, in these systems. Uh, they are so scalable, so small, medium and large ones uh, uh, will undercut, let's say, other prices, uh, uh, let's say grid prices of uh, uh, these things. So there is really good reasons uh, to have one, yeah, to invest in one. Yeah? And even um, financial organizations are ready to... Uh, contribute so uh, you de you don't need an if and you not even need to have the money for that you will find an investor for a good business case they will uh, be happy on a good internal rate of return so that's what i see uh, worldwide and uh, if i look in europe same thing um, and um, <coughs> there is this good other opportunity with energy storage uh, we are looking at the market um, yeah, since the beginning of uh, the lithium-ion uh, production, uh, MW is providing facilities for the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing of lithium-ion cells. So we know uh, the cost breakdown of a cell, there is less than uh, very, very low, uh, let's say, um, uh, percentage of 
um, uh, labor and energy in the cell. So I think there is good yeah, opportunity to have big factories in Europe um, for cells, for the e-mobility and uh, for stationary applications. And this will help renewable integration. I'm very much sure that uh, this happens. The uh, question is how fast. Yeah? So <coughs> that's, uh, that's my thing. And um, well, if, if you e just say with the crystal ball element, how fast do you think it could be? Just uh, your own personal opinion. My, my personal opinion, we will see 20, uh, 2020 a uh, really acceptable uh, price of energy storage. Um, I will, I'm waiting on a good price where I buy my private one yeah, <laughs> for, my, for my house. Yeah. It, I will do, I'm no, no doubt about. Um, and I just, uh, let's say, uh, look for a shorter payback period. Um, but um, for uh, the e-mobility, and if this will take off shortly, uh, there will be battery stations, um, <coughs> what you have in your house, uh, to charge your car overnight from the solar earnings what you had over the day. Yeah, because if I want to drive to work with my CO2-free car um, during the day, and I say, yeah, I need to store my CO2-free sun power overnight in my uh, separate storage at home, and then load storage to storage. So um, <coughs> PV will load the storage on the one side to be CO2-free. Even people would be ready to pay a bit more for that because of they have the spirit uh, to have low CO2 in their transport. So I think that's a second big part of why PV will succeed in the region. Well, I think that's some very good points ready to start. So you're looking at cost depreciation, yep. keeping the competitiveness up, then looking at the innovations that we see around energy storage and e-mobility to also drive interest in Absolute. buying together with PV. Absolute. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuart, how, how do you see it? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come and talk today. Um, I am the Chief Sales Officer of Solar Solutions, and we own the brand of AEG for solar panels. So um, we can sell AEG solar panels around the world, and we believe that as the, the world of panels starts to become very commoditized, having worldwide recognized brands allows you to be able to communicate to a wider audience about, about your product. And we also have some pri prior pri proprietary technology, which is a, a small sensor that sits inside our junction box and allows you to individually monitor the performance of each solar panel. Um, and you, you, know, you talk about the future, and um, we believe that, that our industry needs to become an awful lot more connected to the Internet of Things, to become part of a wider world of Snapchat and Instagram and YouTubers and vBloggers and all those other other things that I don't understand, but my 14-year-old son <laughs> does. Um, so when you, I was thinking about the, the future and thinking about today, um, it's just after lunch, and it's, sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge listening to people talk. So I thought we'd have a little competition. People protect themselves from the future by, by buying things, and a lot of the things they buy are things like gold. I looked at the um, gold futures market this morning, and a troy ounce of gold is about $1,300 or 1,000 euros for, a, for an ounce of gold, and it, it kind of increases. So we have a sensor that allows you to individually monitor the performance of a module, which, unless you buy a very expensive um, Tygo or Solar, Solar Edge or Enphase junction box, it, it, it's a bit of a mystery. People can't really see what your system's doing. So um, we allow you to see that what's happening to those panels immediately, instantly something happens. So if anybody here by the end of this hour-long session can tell me a link between this gold coin and my solar sensor that allows you to see inside solar panels, then you can keep it. <laughs> okay? But, but on, a, on a very serious point, um, our I was at um, Electrolux's brand symposium in Barcelona a couple of weeks ago. Uh, with 150 companies who have various different brands that they sell of Electrolux products. So washing machines, dishwashers, power tools, solar panels, inverters, a whole range of things. Electrolux are now putting cameras inside their refrigerators in America so that mothers can check to see if they've got enough milk when they're out shopping. And that's the level of interconnection and interactivity that our industry needs to get to to be able to appear to a wider audience such that people feel comfortable about buying these kind of products to put on their roofs when in, when in truth they're slightly ugly and 
and people don't necessarily want them on their roof. But if they can have a, a dialogue with those products, then they can. Yes. No, no, I like that. Some very, very good points in there as well. I mean, just to come back on the old crystal ball gazing, you're talking about this digitalization and the need to engage more with the consumers so that we can provide those type of services. When do you see that coming on? Again, your own personal opinion. Well, well funnily enough, we already <laughs> have that technology. So I think it's, I think it's immediate. The, but, but it's the tip of an iceberg. I think people, people buy a system, it sits on their roof. And what we really want to be in a situation is where the installer rings them up to say, oh, excuse me, sir, your panel's not working as it should do. I'm sending an engineer, he will replace it tomorrow. So we get to a level of customer service that, that is equal to the rest of the, of the commercial world. And I think when we get to that level of, of understanding and communication, there will be a much wider audience of people that will be wanting to, to, to adopt these kind of technologies and this kind of energy saving. So, and I think adding to that with storage, there's an awful lot more that storage can communicate and panels can communicate to the end user. So I think, I think over the next two to three years, we'll see a, a real shift in, in the way in which we talk to our, our audience, our customers about the products. So irrespective of whether it's a 100 megawatt power plant in the Chilean desert or it's a three kilowatt um, house on the, on the roof of Mr. Schmidt, there'll be an awful lot more communication from us, I think. And if we do that, then I think there's a very bright future. And so what I'll take from that final point is to say that really it's about the digitalization agenda and how solar plays its role in that. That's how we'll be able to drive things forward. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you can solve that conundrum, you can win some gold. I mean, there's not many panel shows you can go to where you get that kind of an offer. Not many. <laughs> Please, Sven, on, on to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Sven. I'm the managing director of Renusol. Renusol is a racking company. So many of you may think, well, racking company, that's the metal side of the business, storage. Um, you know, first, I think we do have a very bright future, but I think there's still a long way to go. I would sort of agree with Manfred, maybe around 220, maybe even a little later. We'll get there. And I'd like to maybe show it from a different perspective. Um, so we as a racking company, we of course have to deal or we deal with a lot of installers, right? So the people actually going out there putting these things on the roof. So there's uh, a typical storage system would go onto a residential house today um, and or a medium commercial um, company, right? So, and, and there's two sectors. The ones building the smaller systems today are electricians, are roofers, are he companies that install heating at home. Now, where I, and you know, and I live in a very small town close to here, and I go to my neighbors and I ask them, why do you not have a PV system on your house? Why don't you do any, something with storage? And of course, it's not very profitable yet with storage, but even just to have a small PV system on their house, and everybody's saying, you know, well, I considered it before, and I got this electrician, and you know, I, I tried to get some advice, and it always turns out it wasn't explained very good, really. And I think we have a lot still to do as an industry on the education side. And then, uh, you know, since my customers or Renusol's customers are, of course, large wholesalers, are EPC companies, but for the residential, in the end, the small installer, small, uh, the electrician, goes to the wholesaler, buys our system. So I said to myself, well, if they don't explain it right, I myself went to the small, you know, smaller electrician heating companies and said, hey, so I was there. He said, you didn't explain it right. Why are you not? You have the knowledge. And I know they have the knowledge, right? Because I'm dealing with them for all these years. And the answer I get is, you know what? PV right now is not interesting for me or not interesting enough because interest rates are low and everybody's building houses. My books are full with wiring houses, with putting tiles on a roof. Right? So right now, they do not have an interest in selling solar, and I think that is a very big part of it. Um, because I do see, if I keep going to my neighbors and explain, they'll adapt to it, especially with interest rates low now. They, they don't get anything for the money on the bank, right? And in, in the countries we live in, Germany, France, there is enough money for everybody to spend 4,000 euros on a PV system. So I'm right in thinking that you're saying that there's a sort of labor shortage to actually get the PV systems up there, and that's the main challenge that you're seeing at the moment. The, 
the, the labor shortage and that it's just not interesting enough to put a three to five kW system on a residential home for the traditional installer right I now. See, I see. I, I, it's a little different on the commercial side. So just in my hometown, there is like this medium company uh, doing breaks, right? They have a lot of machinery. Um, in partnership w with a different company, they put an 800 kW system on their roof um, with storage, with different energy options, you know, to, to get to, towards a high percentage of self-coverage. And there are these companies in the solar business out there that concentrate on that, I'd say on the systems between 300 kW to, to a megawatt and probably to 750 kW in the future in Germany because we have that cap. Um, and they have their books full, they build, but we don't, there is not that many companies in Germany on that. And they will not concentrate on the residential market because for them to deal with a megawatt system is just as much work as to deal with a 3KW system. But you would still say there is a future. Uh, there to go there to is definitely wall. a future. There is definitely a future, <laughs> but there are a couple of hiccups on the yes. way. Thank you. Golo, how are you seeing things? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I work for a company uh, that is providing basically solutions to help companies uh, to get from sketch to scale globally to uh, bring it to simple terms. And uh, I'm working for the energy segment, which is actually in active in that industry since uh, 2009, trying to find solutions, um, how a global big organization can actually help that industry to mature and to grow globally. Because a lot of um, the challenges when you want to go scale are driven by quick access to market and you all know that uh, you have subsidy-driven markets that are volatile, unpredictable, so you need to have a lot of strategic flexibility, quick access to markets. The other thing is um, standardization. Quite often discussed, automotive, for instance, is quite advanced when it comes to platform approaches, but how can we learn from other industries and implement these uh, lessons learned and best practices in order to accelerate the technical developments and the market developments within the energy industry and uh, we're not looking only on storage on PV we look at the complete landscape on a global scale but uh, let me give you one example where we saw that uh, there's a chance where we can really contribute benefits to the industry which is currently energy storage and utility scale where you see a lot of individual solutions coming up containerized solutions but everybody is cutting and screwing on the container with one two um, volumes that really doesn't make sense and we said what if there's a there's a party who could provide across the different uh, manufacturers a standard container platform that contains everything that is necessary that can be standardized and then the different um, manufacturers have the bandwidth the time the resources to focus on battery technology and last but not least which comes increasingly software solutions that help their customers actually applying this product more easily yeah, in order to reduce the hurdles and the investment needed going forward. So basically as well what you're talking about is finding solutions within the existing value chain to make sure that it's more cost effective, the kind of solution that you're talking about, providing a container which has all of the solutions in one position rather than having to go to a lot of different suppliers like your own company is doing. Exactly. And um, always trying to have a kind of a helicopter view on the total system and understanding what is the concrete challenge that our customers are having with their customers and how we can help with either supply chain services or with even product solutions because we see that the hardware, for instance, becomes less and less of an importance, but it's a solid basis uh, where you are adding as, as a... As a, as a as a party who is working with the end customer, uh, the solutions. So the solutions become more of an importance as more than the, the hardware, um, basically, that is the basis for it. No, I, I totally understand what you're saying. We improve cost effectiveness and efficiency through the value chain, and that's how we actually maintain maybe some of Manfred's points by becoming more cost competitive for the whole system. You may have noticed indeed that we have been joined by Sonia uh, Bernard, who is the Vice President for Sales Europe for Talisson Solar. And so you know, you're perfectly in time, Sonia, because I was just about to go out into the audience and try and force them after lunch to throw some questions at the panel. But it gives you your opportunity to look into your crystal ball and tell us. What are the opportunities and what are the challenges we're facing in Europe for solar today? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you for keeping you a bit longer time. Uh, uh, I think everyone knows the, the difficulty the European customer is facing is uh, 
is uh, where to get uh, cost-effective panels when you want to kick off the project. Uh, when you do the financial model analysis, you need to get the famous IRR, which is a, a matching meeting of your investors' uh, requirement. Uh, Telson, what we are doing is uh, we realize the requirement from the market to see how we deliver a cost-effective modules to the European country, which is under the undertaking for the time being. We have uh, uh, we have a come up a solution is uh, we do have our factory, which is in Thailand. Uh, we, we have our factory is uh, in the south of uh, Thailand, close to the Pattaya. Uh, Thailand is uh, a, booming, a booming country for the, for the solar. And uh, with the cost of people, cost of labor is quite low. And uh, we have uh, set up all the automatic machines to really control the cost of the module production. And uh, therefore, we can provide a very cost-effective modules to the European market. We're still trying to dramatically reduce the cost so we can have more people in the European region to be able to kick off their PV project so we can all be in a win-win situation, you go your project, and we can support you with the cost-effective solution so we can go with you and grow with you. Um, we have uh, most of the other suppliers maybe think the, U the European market is not very important compared with the other regions. Let's say it probably is only six giga, but in China, only one country is about 20 giga. But w our company is, we think, European is uh, nearly the origin of the PV industry. So we are really concentrated on the European region. We have a different sales to concentrate with different country. So we are determined to stay in this region to help the customers in this region to grow. So, um, so that is, uh, I think, is... Everyone is looking for the magic ball, what would be the pricing, and yeah. whether the MIP <laughs> it will be gone away. I think I need to turn it to you <laughs> to see <laughs> whether yes, you can give us some question. forecast. <laughs> I haven't got a crystal ball that can give you an answer to that one, I'm afraid. Uh, but yes, we're working on it. Uh, so you know, just to just summarize what I'm saying, your real focus is on getting the price down, being able to bring cost-effective solutions to the consumer in Europe so that the market will continue to grow. And of course, yes, we do have to worry about our trade measures for a little bit yeah. longer. And and I can't just give you an answer. One more I won't be able to little that. point <laughs> is uh, in order to help our customer really to save all this administration work, et cetera, we are doing, we prefer to do DDP in cold terms. So there's no, uh, all the rest of the hassles in the logistic chain. Yeah, that's very good. Now, I really would like to ask the audience if any of you would be willing to put a question to the panel. I obviously have plenty more questions, but I think we've got 10 more minutes. Have we got 10 more minutes? I think we have, so there is time for questions. Anybody want to ask them about the crystal balls? Anybody want to win Stuart's gold? <laughs> He's still got it. No? No? Okay. Well, then I will fight on against the coma that has taken over, the food coma that's taken over our audience. Um, and just say, you know, uh, what do you think in terms of the way that the market is developing uh, in Europe, and it's got a slowish market, what do you think are the kind of innovations that we would probably need to see uh, to overcome some of the challenges that have been picked up today so that solar really can become one of the core parts of the energy future within the next 10 to 15 years. Just to put that into the context of the regulatory environment, we're looking at a new renewable energy directive, of course, in Brussels, where I come from, which should be in effect after 2020. What would you like to see coming out of that? What is it we need? Please. Yeah, um, I, would, I would wish that we have a, a bit more predictability in terms of the regular environment, because uh, that's one of the things that uh, currently slowing down the, the, complete, um, the complete development that 
you don't really know where the investment is going to. So it's really hard to, to establish a business case. Um, but um, to the same extent, I would wish that we are able to get rid of the need to have, uh, to have subsidies, for instance. Yeah? So what if we would um, have the strength of the industry leveraged to that extent that the industry is basically able to provide solutions that are independent from this uh, Regularity, uh, regularity environment and uh, is somehow driving the development. So I'm a strong supporter actually of let the market um, act and provide the necessary stability, but freedom as well to the market to develop. Well, I guess if we're talking about the cost competitiveness that everybody's mentioned, in a way, if we create our own market, regulation should be less important. Would you see it like that as well, Sven, Stuart, Manfred? Well, well is this on? Yeah. So my big wish would be that, you know, politics would drive the renewables a little more, but not with feed-in tariffs or subsidies or whatever, but, um, and I'm, but, but not to trash it as much. Because, again, we're talking to my neighbors, what, what, you know, if they think of PV, they hear, all right, so next year I have to pay two cents on my kilowatt hour that I use. Right? That's what they hear. Um, and with that, it's gone. So I'd actually would like it if we had a stronger lobby. That's really, I think, what we need. You're very welcome to join and have ta help take us up. Stuart. Uh, I'm, I'm a lot less concerned, to be honest. Um, I, th I think that, first of all, this year we'll sell something like 60 gigawatts of, of power around the world. And the forecast is another 10% on top of that next year. So I think... I think that first of all, you have to be a global player in this industry. You have to be able to approach all the markets because, because markets vary. They go up, they go down, as does, as does every other commodity market that we have in the world. So, so overall, the, the, the rumors that the photovoltaic, photovoltaic industry have died is somewhat kind of uh, <laughs> misleading because there's, there's strong growth in our industry. Um, I think it was JO or Jinko, can't remember, their first quarter results showed module manufacturing costs them around 38 cents, dollar, US dollar cents a watt. So this, this kind of protectionism with the, the minimum import price is, is hurting Europe at the moment. But once that goes away, and it will go away sometime soon, whether that's six months, 12 months, whatever, then we'll have a much more competitive product to put into these systems. Um, people. People say, well, you know, why would you want to be in the PV industry at the moment? And I mean, we launched uh, the AEG brand back into the market at this show last year. Um, we turned over a million euros in the first six months, which isn't great, but we've turned over 20 million euros in the last six months. So it's a 20-fold growth rate in six months because there's a brand that appeals to people and a brand that talks to people outside of the normal world of, of, of these strange names that, that are attached to solar panels and inverters. So I think once we become much more mainstream in the way in which we, we carry out our business and appeal to people through, through brand and communication that they understand um, and that people are gravitating towards these days, you know, the evil word, the mobile phone app. But that's the way in which people create business these days. So I think as long as we focus on becoming much more modern in our approach, then I think we've got a very healthy industry. And I've still got this one gold troy ounce here if anybody wants to try and win it. Thank you for that, Stuart. I think that was very comprehensive. I'm not going to make any comments on it because I think it's spot on. Manfred, would you like to uh, add yeah. anything to that? Yeah, if I could make a wish, I would uh, um, to do so two things. So there is uh, one thing, I think, on the uh, CO2 emission um, uh, level. Uh, Germany is at uh, 550. That's not so very much good. Yeah. Um, so we made an attempt together with uh, the Deutsche DLR, the Fraunhofer, and um <coughs> uh, some other companies uh, to look at a nationwide integration possibility of uh, renewables. Yeah. So if they are still um, uh, volatile, uh, we have that problem, and we will face problems. And this uh, will uh, lead to my second wish, uh, that the innovation in the uh, system storage will increase. And it's good that big worldwide companies are working on good solutions, that the cost is coming down. The growth rate of uh, storage is tremendous. Yeah? And if we look for uh, an average learning rate in the past, what they uh, um, set to, uh, to get the cost down, 
that's good. So um, <coughs> uh, in this uh, project, what we have there uh, called Thermworld, uh, we compare to thermal energy, uh, which has a lot of CO2. And to come to a tenth of the value is not, let's say, unpayable. Yeah? Um, and if we look for 220 and we made a perspective to 230, uh, it doesn't look so bad. Yeah? Even for Germany, where we look for other countries, like in uh, Morocco, even we look for the Saudis, uh, which they have lots of, a lot more solar offerings there. Um, I think uh, um, having these uh, results in mind uh, with more innovation on storage and uh, some maybe regulatory uh, um, border limits on CO2, it will accelerate tremendously this development. And do you think, and taking Stuart's point on, do you think that there's a necessity for the branding to come in? I mean, you see some strong brands in storage already. Do you yeah. think that will make a difference in the storage market? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need, we need good bankable uh, brands and, and uh, let's say investors uh, <laughs> over these 30 years of experience I have, uh, and I'm a system engineer, yeah, but at the end, the investors make the go or the no-go. So you need to, to have a good system on the table, which is so-called bankable. It comes with a good certainty in, in the predictability of the money return and uh, the failure rate and these things. So uh, storage will make it in the future that there is it is a commodity then as well. Not so much today, but uh, PV is clear now. It is fully bankable. And if storage reached this in some years, um, it helps a lot. Yeah, and I think that just the final point on that, the KFW loan that's been given in Germany has also helped drive storage last year yeah. it's going to be con uh, continued and i know we've set up on the panel we don't need subsidies but do you think the subsidies are needed for storage um not so much. I think um, I'm unhappy about the storage subsidy in Germany uh, for the household storages because if they make it unnecessarily expensive. Yeah, that's bad. They should stop that actually, yeah, and benefit from uh, um, let's say uh, the the development and be tough in in pricing. Um, I know it's not so easy to have uh, uh, millions uh, investment in system development returned. Yeah, but. Uh, things will take, uh, take up and one day the, the, uh, the, the uh, subsidy goes away and then we will find real prices uh, in some years we will be there. Yeah. Thank you for that, Manfred. And Sonia, what do you see as the needs uh, from a regulatory, do we need a regulatory <laughs> environment even? How do, how do you see it? I think uh, if we one day we can achieve the great parity, it's much healthy in the solar industry. So from a uh, module development point of view, we are always working on the pay attention more on the research and development to really uh, to come up with uh, high efficiency modules. We are also thinking there's a different application. I can see some other uh, like uh, double glass modules, uh, double facial modules are coming up, which can increase uh, for the double facial modules, can increase the efficiency and reduce the system costs. I think uh, if one day we can reach the great parity, with the industry can be booming again. So I think uh, these days uh, some of the, the module pricing become artificially higher. That's why it's uh, shrink uh, the development of the PV project. Yeah. And I think we'll just move on to a different angle and talk about markets that we see. And in Europe, we talk about Europe, but Europe is, of course, a huge collection of countries. Perhaps the European Union is going to be a collection of uh, countries with one shorter tomorrow morning. We'll have to see how that, that plays out. But how, how do each of you see the... Yeah, I know I'm British. You can't get away from that today. Sorry, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, how do you see the markets in Europe individually? Which are the best ones? Where are you looking at in terms of the different segmentation? You're all actively involved in the industry. Are there specific winners that you see, specific losers? I mean, maybe we'll start that again, Sonia, so you can pick up again and we'll come back to this end and finish with Golo. Good. I think that's probably going to be it. Unless yeah. anybody in the audience wants to ask a question, you've still got a chance and you still can win Stuart's gold. I don't know how many French people in the audience, but I think uh, for me, the uh, French market is a very important market. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the UK market is down. And uh, the French market is not uh, booming like uh, UK, Italy, and in uh, Spain. But the French market is always very stable with the, with the tender process, with the engagement of the government. We have uh, something like a 1.1 giga of the tender project every year till the 2019. So for me, sorry, I'm, I'm a kind of French. 
I think the French market is, uh, is the key market that we're going to keep focusing. Some good patriotism there. Yes, okay, man for it. <laughs> yeah, what we experienced here um, in Germany is that even the Eastern Europe uh, countries can be uh, a good goal for us. Yeah? Um, I was involved in some uh, questions and future projects in, in, in the East. In, uh, there is the question, and even if you go a, a bit for farther east, let's say the Ukraine, yeah, um, <coughs> then, uh, then question number one would be, uh, will an investment case be sure enough? Yeah? Uh, because if we as a system integrator, as a PC company, we are out after one and a half years and then uh, <laughs> it's the investor's risk. But there is a good answer. I didn't have expected that, that um, there uh, would be insurance um, um, constructs around it. The, uh, the German oil helmets will then, um, let's say, put an, um, an envelope around a feed-in regime, what is guaranteed by Kiev. You might say, yeah, Kiev is not sure enough, but oil helmets is sure. So uh, I think these kind of uh, countries have um, a big space, uh, big demand, uh, high CO2, um, and uh, they needed to keep up in their renewable plans to, let's say, associate with uh, Europe. So my point of view, this will be very interesting uh, in the next coming years. So you've gone from the far west to the far east. Yeah. Is there anything <laughs> in between, Stuart? <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think Spain is one of, the, one of the best examples of legislation gone horribly wrong. Um, from, a, from a height of three gigawatts one year to uh, 2004, 13, I think there were 23 megawatts installed in the whole of Spain. So um, I think often legislation causes more problems than, than problems it solves. I think that th as we look forward in our crystal ball, I think we'll, we'll end up with, with really two industries. One will be an investment industry where people are building large-scale power plants and, and looking for returns on investment that will, will excite investors. And then the other scale will be... Um, at the domestic and small scale rooftop inst installation where people will become, they'll, they'll sell solar panels in a different way. I mean, nobody has ever asked the, the, the eternal, internal rate of return on double glazing. It's about 20,000 years, I think. But, but people <laughs> never think about that when they buy double glazing. They're thinking about other options. And I think that's where, in Europe especially, the, the industry needs to refocus its, its thought process on how to market. We need to market to a different story and a different conversation. And I think when you do that, the constraints of, of a Spanish market or a French market move away because, because you're selling into a different aspect and a different place. And I think, I think over the next three years, we'll see two very distinct markets where even the panels will be different designs, the inverters will be different, th th they'll all be designed in the, in the retail area to make a retail consumer experience. And at the other end of the market, they'll be looking at the bare bones r rate of return. So the cheapest possible module, doesn't matter what it looks like, the cheapest possible inverter, everything to get that return on investment. So I think it will split over the next few years and we'll see a completely different set of industries. And I think just picking on that in the segmentation, what we've seen in the recent global market outlook from Solar Power Europe is that we're talking about a 70, 75% market in the rooftop. And of course there is com commercial industry in that as well, but the household is near where there's potential in Europe. I think in London it's 3% of roofs actually have solar PV at the moment. So yeah, I think this is a, a very good point. So and I think, I think, as I've mentioned before, this sensor that we have in our junction box allows everybody to see the performance of each individual module. And at the moment, our industry doesn't let people do that. It, it blocks the access to what's happening with panels to make it easier to protect our warranties and easier to protect the mystery of installation. When in fact, what we really need to do is to be open and honest about, about what we provide to the customer. Hence my little sensor that allows you to see inside the world. Hello, thank, you. thank you for that, Stuart. And the good news is we have a gentleman in the audience who wants to ask a question. Please give your name and your organization. And if there's somebody in specific you want to answer the question, please let us know. Hello, my name is Bönisch, Jens Bönisch, and I'm a PV planner. And you were talking about two different markets. And I'm interested if there isn't another third market, which is called the so-called so the rebel PV, PV systems, those microsystems um, consisting of one or two modules, which can in Germany just be a plug-in system. 
what do you think about those micro systems? That's a, that's a fair question. Does anybody want to take it or shall I force someone? <laughs> go on, Stuart, then you're just finishing, so go on. I think that um, th there certainly will be a, a change in the way p panels and, and, and inverters work together in the future. And I think that the idea of a plug and play solar panel that you can just pick up and, and plug into your home, I think over time will develop because it will then move into the Ikeas and the, and the, and the, um, the do-it-yourself shops that people can go and just pick up a panel. But at the moment, we're reluctant to do that because it's, it's, it doesn't suit our needs. Our needs are to sell huge volumes of panels, etc. But I think that, as always, when there is a niche opportunity, someone will exploit that opportunity and, 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 and um, develop a market out of it. But I think it's a, a two or three years away from now because people at the moment don't have the interest to do that. So it's kind of, it will be a very slow growing market of, of, of tiny percentages. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Do appreciate the uh, audience interaction. So we'll come back to the uh, question we're going along the panel with though. Markets and Stuart's broadened it into segments, quite rightly. Yeah, so I would agree a lot with Stuart and Manfred. So we have two sections and really so the, you know, the larger plants with investment, they, they can pop up anywhere really. Um, but if we go back to that residential market, mid-sized commercial market, um, you're, you're very quickly back to the, I'd say, Western European countries um, that, for one, are stabilizing because there's always a few things that need to come together. For one, people need to have the income and the money to be able to afford those systems, and you need a large population as well so that many people can build it because otherwise you won't have a market. What's very surprising um, to us, for example, um, so f this year we're tripling, and, and I mean it's not a large number, but we're tripling our sales volume in Scandinavia. So there's actually like Sweden um, is, is very big right now. Um, I'm, compared to worldwide numbers, it's, it's very small, right? But Austria, Switzerland, if you go to those smaller systems, they're stable for years now. I mean, they build 120 megawatts maybe a year, but they do that every year, very stable. And I think that's where, at least for the smaller segment, that's where the market will sort of stay. And you don't see something happening, though, for some example, in Poland, thinking of a, a country with a large population, the economy's not that bad. Uh, so it's getting cheaper and cheaper. What about, what about Poland? Sorry, I have to pick you up on it, because you said <laughs> fine. You, uh, there's you're, nothing you're right. out there. But what about Poland? <laughs> Um, I think Poland will come as well. Um, it, for me, that's a typical new market, um, as most of the new markets. And I think being in PV now for I don't know how many years, um, you know, you always see that you have markets that want to get into solar, and they're just reluctant at the beginning. But at some point, once you have the acceptance, and for example, in Germany, there's a very high acceptance with you know whoever's out there on solar. Um, and I, and I think we will see the same thing in Poland. I, I just don't know when. Okay, now that's fair enough. Golo. Yeah, the other question is actually what, what will be the, the future market in terms of um, what, what are the offerings actually? And uh, one thing that I'm thinking or we're thinking about is today we are living in a connected world. Yeah? So there's a lot of data available anywhere, but connected is as well connection within the industries and learning from other industries. And one of the things uh, we are really excited to see happening. We have markets already with a, with a high share of renewables, but the question is when will be um, a system established like an internet of energy, for instance, yeah? so that we have a lot of people being able to sell electricity to each other, and we see that as a potential as well to boost um, the, the renewable growth and um, the underlying systems, actually. Yeah, no, I think that's part of the whole idea there would be uh, the different services you get through digitalization of energy and as solar becomes part of the internet of things it's very clear that that we as a technology have that possibility where most other conventional generations certainly don't now i just wonder if there is any time for one more question from the audience there is i'm getting a nod would anyone else like to have a go and ask uh, questions to the panel if not i think i am under pressures more or less uh, wrap this up and uh, move on to the next uh, the next installment that you'll have. But before I do that, I would just like to say thank you very much to Sonia. It was very great that you could join us. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Sven. Thank you, Golo. We have some very good insights into what we can expect for the future. We've covered on things like cost competitiveness. We've looked at price. 
we've looked at the digitalization of energy, we've looked at the solutions that can be found along the value chain and how we need to overcome some of the difficulties of not having a labor force at the moment. I would say our general impression would be that we've got a, f a future that's very positive for solar, globally and in Europe. We just need to work together to make sure that that happens. My final thing is an announcement. Tonight, Solar Power Europe is having their booth party. We're at B2410. There'll be lots of food and drink, so please come along. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Oh, and Stuart's gold coin. If anybody wants to have a go, please do. Thank you. The, this, this gold coin, as I, as I said before, one troy ounce of gold is $1,350 on today's market. Our sensor allows you to look inside a solar system and see what's actually happening. If you could look inside this gold coin, you'd see that it's only gold plated. So it's only worth $10. So you really need to be careful about what you're buying and make sure you can see inside. And if you can see inside, you'll understand your investment. Thank you for that final word, Stuart. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the show.